Welcome back to Third Phase of Moon. Blake Cousins along with my brother Brent. We're reporting for the Big Island tonight and you can hear maybe the Cokies in the background. They're frogs, not birds. But we wanted to share with you what's been going on around the world. You've seen them, we've seen them, and it's been seen and it's been made and something is behind it. In my opinion, it's reverse engineered technology, not of this world. It's called the TR-3B and we're here tonight with a special interview that we conducted on a windy day in Hollywood with Michael Schratt, aerospace historian. He's gonna break it down how the TR-3B works and incredible case files of the infamous triangular craft. Now listen up. So this is actually 1990 Barnsley, England. This is a 30 year career police officer. This is his original sketch. Now this is coming out of a Fleetwood Mac concert, believe it or not. His wife was with him. They were driving down the road, exiting the conference, the concert. And he looks off to the left and he sees this gigantic black triangle that emerged from this dark cloud and he's absolutely astonished at what he saw. Now, when he got home, he drew this picture. This is his original sketch. This thing was about 200 feet per side. Uh, it had an indented section in the center. On these rectangular window sections, there were people there. So I'm gonna move on to the next one. So this is his original sketch. Here you can see my cleaned up AutoCAD drawing. And this is this cross beam and girder construction that pops up in the Hudson Valley Boomerang, multiple other cases. Here you see these human-like figures. I'm gonna move on to the next one. Now this is my first pass illustration to give you an idea of what this thing looked like. And these have been sighted all around the world at this time. Gentlemen, you had a sighting of one of these. So we know that this has been seen. Now, what we wanna do now is we wanna take and go to his original report. This is his original report. I'm not gonna read the entire case here, but something I wanna talk about here. This is his report. The side of the craft appeared to have several illuminated windows. And at one of the windows, I saw two to three figures that appeared to be human. This is not an ET spacecraft. This is one of ours, paid for by classified black budget funding that has been going back for decades. We know that during the Clinton administration, we were spending $100 million a day on black budget programs. These things have no congressional oversight. They have no public scrutiny. They are off the radar screen. The president of the United States does not have a need to know. He hasn't been cleared. He doesn't have a high enough security clearance. He's a temporary employee. So we're not gonna get anything from him or whoever's elected. So it's incumbent upon us to track down these legacy witnesses who worked in these black programs. Now, all of this was the very first pass on this case. So I went to my friend, Joseph Wraith. I'm like, Joseph, can you take it to the next level? Can we do better? Here's what he came up with. And hopefully Cousin Brothers can insert a little bit of a, a higher resolution JPEG here. But this accurately depicts what this retired police officer described. And you can see this cross beam and girder construction on the interior section. We'll go to the next one here. And now we've done a little bit of a blow up. So if anyone thinks this is an ET spacecraft, go knock yourself out. I got a bridge to sell you on the San Andreas Fault. Th these are our technology. We know that because of what the witnesses are telling us. What are they telling us? They're telling us that they're hearing a low frequency electrical humming noise, like a sewing machine or an electrical transformer. We're seeing multicolored lights on these craft. We're seeing craft tested on Thursday nights. When you put all this evidence together, we absolutely have made a breakthrough. There's no doubt about it. So let's go to the final rendering here. And at this point, it's case closed. We, we've made the technology, we've made the breakthrough. These are our craft used for multiple purposes. We've always heard that a lot of these triangles, these boomerangs, they're the size of a football field. We, we've heard this many times. However, in this case, we've got a triangle that is not the size of a football field, but in point of fact, a football stadium. Credit goes to Linda Zimmerman for tracking down the original witness on her. So I want to give her credit. Now she interviewed a reference librarian. This is November, 1985, Yorktown Heights, New York. This is all within this Hudson Valley boomerang wave. Now, if you can't trust a reference librarian, who are you going to trust? So somewhere we have to draw the line here. We have to consider this reliable witness testimony. So she's waiting for her husband. 
and this 800 foot long 60 degree isosceles triangle black basically hovers over her car. She looks up and sees this thing. This is what it looks like. Uh, we had a white light at each corner. There was a series of white lights on the back and this thing is about 800 feet across the size of a football stadium. She noticed that there was an iris that opened up on the bottom of this thing and a red light came out from the back of this craft, went up inside the iris and then it closed down. Now before this iris closed, she looked and got a good look on the inside of the craft and she said that what it looked like was stacked apartment complexes like terraced apartment complex with white lights on the background. So this is the very first pass of what this craft looks like. Here's my AutoCAD drawing that gives you an idea. And again, this is a reference library, November 1985. Her name is Maureen Davis. We want to give her credit. But it's the same type concept here. We've got white light at the corner, this red light detached from the craft. Now, I want to highlight something here. If I go to the next illustration, this is what I thought the interior might look like. I wasn't completely satisfied with what this depiction looks like here. I thought maybe I'm seeing something wrong. Maybe I'm not interpreting what she was saying correctly. So I went to my good friend Joseph Wright and I pitched this idea to him. Can we do a more accurate representation of what this craft looks like? And he came up with what she originally saw as this thing is hovering over her vehicle. Can you imagine something 800 feet across, literally 200 feet above your vehicle, waiting for your husband and this thing comes flying by? So we went to the next illustration and now it makes sense, okay? It's got this concentric ring circle like the banisters at an opera house. This is much more accurate to what we're talking about here. Now, I'm gonna move on to the next illustration. We have this red or amber colored orb. This amber light popped out from the back of the vehicle, went up inside the iris, and then this iris closed, and then this thing departed. But the point I wanna make here is, this is much more consistent with what we believe the interior of this craft actually looks like here. And then here you can see the craft with the amber light up inside, and so again, we can take the testimony of this reference librarian. I think we can take it to heart. She's a reliable witness. Why would she be lying about this? And this is one of 25,000 eyewitnesses that saw the Hudson Valley boomerang wave, which included multiple different configurations between 1982 to 1989. Okay, quick update on Roswell. July 2nd, 1947. We know that the next morning, July 3rd, 1947, that's when Mac Brazel and seven-year-old Timothy D. Proctor came across the debris field. Now, if we go forward in time, you know that the bodies were exposed to the elements for the night of the 2nd, the 3rd, the 4th, the 5th, the 6th, the evening of the 7th, and then that's where the retrieval operation began and then into the morning of the 8th. So whatever biological material was out there, it was already decomposing by the time the U.S. military got involved. Now, we want to go over to this illustration here by Tom Bogan. This is Tom Carey and Don Schmidt's version of the story, okay? So we have a main craft that disintegrated over the Foster Ranch. The craft continued heading eastbound, which is the escape pod, which landed about 35 miles north of Roswell, which was the size of about a 13 foot long egg-shaped craft with a dome on top, something similar to the size of a Volkswagen. That's what we're talking about here. Now, five bodies were recovered. One was still alive. There was a survivor that was seen by Marion Black Mac Magruder at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, April 1948. Now, we have a witness. We've got to look inside the escape pod, which is kind of a world exclusive here. This is William Bud Taylor. He was part of the 830th at Roswell at the time. He got to look inside. And so I said, okay, let's get the testimony from William Bud Taylor. I got that from Tom Carey. I went to Rudy and I said, Rudy, can you please provide me with an illustration based on his testimony? And this is what we came up with here. So this is on the interior of the egg-shaped craft. There was a hull breach. According to Bud Taylor, there were flat screen monitors on the inside wall of this egg-shaped craft. There were hieroglyphic type writing on the interior as well. And then there was this fiber optics that we've heard about before. 
In a nutshell, that's what he described. Now we've got some new information indicating that the bodies had already exited the craft, but this gives you an idea of what it perhaps looked like when these members of the 519th Bomb Group got there. This would have been the evening of the 7th and the morning of July 8th, 1947. How do these vehicles fly? Well, based on some of the information by <clears throat> Bill McDonald, he believes that the pilots of the craft themselves are fully integrated into the propulsion system of the vehicle. In other words, they won't fly without the pilots. And so there's this brainwave frequency, biocortex type integration that's integrated into the cells on the bottom of the craft. And these things work hand in hand. They, it's a form, fit and function type vehicle. They cannot fly without the pilots. Now, we know from the eyewitness testimony that a number of these man-made vehicles incorporate multiple capacitor plates. These are charged to millions of volts. And then when there's a high voltage charge applied to these capacitor plates, there's a movement in the direction of the positive charge. And that kind of explains why we have these CE2 effects. We have these close encounter of the second kind CE2 effects where car engine stalls, uh, we have different type of televisions, we've got radio static. That's all a part of these electrogrid propulsion systems. Now, we also want to talk about what Edgar Fouché had talked about, this liquid mercury vortex engine that dates back to a thousand years before Christ with the Vimana scripts. So that's something we want to consider. In a nutshell, according to Edgar Fouché, these magnetic field disrupting devices they pressurize these things to 250,000 atmospheres, and then they rotate them at 50,000 RPM. There's a resultant decrease in the way that mass interacts with gravity by about 89%, thereby allowing the pilots to only feel 11% of the Gs. And that explains these 90 degree left-hand turns and also explains additional CE2 effects. So these are two propulsion systems that we've identified on these man-made craft. Now we want to consider why does a toilet seat cover cost $600? Why does a screwdriver cost $300? That's because the military industrial complex has cost expenses written into their programs to cover secrecy. So they've got to keep these crown jewels under wraps. It represents our best technology. These are the silver bullets. These are the crown jewels. These are the ace in the hole technology. So when you hear these words, ace in the hole, silver bullet, you're talking about these level three or tier three type aircraft. These are your Hudson Valley boomerangs. These are your uh, triangles from Belgium. These are your uh, 19, basically 2000, January 5th, 2000, Southern Illinois flying triangles. Now, we don't want to let this technology get into the hands of our adversaries because we've got to rule the skies. Now, there's something to be said about classification. We don't want things having to do with atomic bomb calculations getting onto the public. We don't want our war fighters frequencies to be revealed. So those things do need to be kept under wraps. However, there are vehicles in place now where these programs can be declassified without any representing any threat to the national security of the United States. And that's the direction we want to go in because that trickle down technology could change the entire landscape of the world. We have enough documented evidence now to prove that Battelle Memorial Institute, which is America's oldest defense contractor, they did receive some of the Roswell debris back in 1947. Now, to expand on your question, Anytime you have a proprietary program, it is exempt from FOIA requests. So the Boeing Phantom Works Bird of Prey, that is a proprietary program. You cannot FOIA that thing. So what the government did in the 40s and 50s regarding crash retrievals is they cut a deal with the defense contractors. They said, we don't care what you have to do and you can commercialize this information and make it, you know, commercialize it for billions of dollars. What they did is they allowed them to make the money on it to reverse engineer the propulsion systems of these vehicles and the advanced weapons systems of these vehicles, moving out of the classified scenario and putting it to the proprietary. So this is now 
under the jurisdiction of the defense contractors. It's proprietary and no longer classified. And that's why senators and congressmen can't get to this information. Michael Schratt, he's got a lot to say with regards to the infamous triangular dark shaped craft that people have been seeing around the world for decades now. And it's quite interesting what he has to say, Brent. What do you make of some of the breakdown of even this recovered Roswell crash? The debris sent to this corporation called Battelle. Yeah, Battelle's kind of a company that's kind of under the radar. When people think of reverse engineered technology, they think it's being transferred from the Roswell incident to maybe a private company like Lockheed Martin. And that's pretty much the go-to company when people think that there's a private corporation reverse engineering these uh, TR-3Bs. But in fact, Battelle goes down as kind of the leading source as the company that's reverse engineering these uh, high-tech uh, crash and retrieval technologies. This is pretty good stuff. Michael breaks it down. I like the way it gets into the concept of how these things are run and, and the propulsion, what drives these things. Pretty uh, fascinating and enter entertaining and enlightening at the same time. Yeah, when you're going to talk about the TR-3B, I don't know anybody better and more qualified than Michael Stratt himself, especially with the case files and all the information that he receives. And let me tell you, it was quite eye-opening when he started to talk about uh, the TR-3B propulsion systems. I didn't know that he got uh, into that kind of detail. And it sounds quite interesting when you think about this reverse engineered technology and how far it could go into changing the world as we know it today. And we at Third Phase of Moon, we've received all kinds of evidence of the infamous triangular craft known as the TR-3B. And we're going to share with you an episode that we put up on Third Phase of Moon, I don't know, approximately three years ago of what we believe is the best evidence of what the TR-3B looks like. Listen up. This is coming in from Portland and we have photographs that could reveal the best evidence of the TR-3B itself. And it's coming in from the Peng base out of Portland, Oregon, in the northeast of Portland, just off the Columbia River. And we've got incredible, and we've got incredible evidence right now coming into our Gmail photographs of something that appears to be the best evidence of a tier three B in my opinion, Brent, I want to get your thoughts. We've got information coming in from uh, Anaheim, including something captured in Europe. But let's get to this right now. This uh, tier three B images right now, Brent, what do you think here? Like this is good, real good. I got to say we're getting actually multiple accounts from people that are seeing it from Cascade Park and Park Rose actually contacted us within hours of this posting and said they were seeing something very strange. This is basically a confirmation of what's going on. And what I like about it is that it seems to be following the, the riverway of Washington, Oregon, the Columbia River, and there's multiple sightings. Pretty exciting. People are stating from Woodland, from Irvington, Grant Park, Rose City Park, that they saw something strange in the skies. and. Uh, People are saying it was headed in the direction of Columbia River. So this is interesting and it is close to the Peng base. So is there a correlation? Is this the infamous TR-3B ready to make a grand entrance to the public? Well, I'm not exactly sure. Brent, what's your thoughts on the size of this thing and what do you think it could be? Yeah, uh, David killed it on these photos and he can say that uh, I, I'm going to rule out right now that these are not CGI. This is not a manipulation of photos. What we're seeing is a real deal. And what I like about it is that I think it's lighting up in Oregon and out of pain that there could be a consistency of what's going on. If you're out in that area, keep an eye and a heads up on this strange, uh, peculiar craft, I must say. Look at it. You can see dynamics of what the TR-3B looks like, but again, it looks a, a slightly different. And if you look at the lights, there are some uh, lights coming from the craft and it almost seems to be that it is definitely uh, military, in my opinion, and not some kind of uh, drone. This thing seems massive in its own sense. And 
from what we're hearing from David, he says it didn't make a sound. And again, he was stating that it was heading into the direction from Woodland to Northeast Portland on its way to the Columbia River. So whatever it is, we're so glad that David submitted these incredible photos. And we're going to ask you to leave your comments below and make sure if you've seen this and you want to share it, just say you saw it right here at Third Phase of Moon first. And we want to give a big shout out to David in regards to his incredible photos. Brett, any last words on this before we get to the next video? Yeah, I'm excited about the next video, but this one is basically some of the best footage and photos I've seen for years. If this is real, uh, it, it's exciting because this is basically next to a military base, uh, proof on the ground with other eyewitnesses. And this looks something like, like you said, Blake, military and something new, very new. Once again, incredible images of what we believe is the reverse engineered aerospace craft that has been designed by humans using reverse engineered technology, maybe not of this world. And like Michael Stratt explained to us earlier in the episode that he believes 100% that this is ours. So don't believe when somebody tells you we don't know what they are out there, especially coming in from a government official. We've reverse engineered it and it's in our assets, in our opinion. Everybody keep safe and keep your eyes on the skies. And if you've captured anything amazing, submit it to us right here at Third Phase of Moon. My email is in the description. Shoot the video, upload it to YouTube and copy, paste that to my email. We look forward to your submission. Keep your eyes on the skies, everybody.